きおじいちゃんいるから違うけど久しぶりにバイブスあげてかうれさんできるらしいか Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Castaway Anime Podcast. I'm Neon Manta. And I'm Crunchy Bagels. And our luck may be down, but our unluck is through the roof because we're back talking to episodes 9 through 16 of Undead Unluck. But first, if you like the podcast and want to hear more of our objectively correct takes, registered trademark, then subscribe to the channel so you don't miss an episode of Castaway Anime. Now, on to the show. Yeah, so last episode, I in particular was a bit more middling on the show than I expected. You two seemed a little. I don't want to say disappointed, because that implies much worse of an opinion than you actually had. But, I, I, was, you know. I was worried that the show was getting a little, like, a little low on the production、uh, side. You know, the, the cracks were starting to show, a lot of ugliness going on in the spoil arc with the tour of CG zombies. And, you know, that problem has not been 100% solved because there, there are a couple moments in this block of episodes that. Kind of look just、uh, atrocious. But、uh, on the whole, comparing like, this block to the last block, this is a much、uh, appreciated improvement.、Uh, I completely agree. Whereas with the last block, I was feeling like a light to mid seven. This one, I can safely say the show has rebounded to be a light eight. It's actually really entertaining now. And you want to know the biggest thing they changed to make me much warmer towards this block? I mentioned they had an episode、time. where they gave Fuko long hair. Well, yeah, that single handedly. That, that episode was a 10 out of 10 just for the longer hair. But <laughs> then、no. they had an episode、note. take place inside <laughs> a, a school classroom <laughs> with dramatic atmospheric lighting where the, all they did was talk inside of it for like 10 minutes. And I, and I wrote in my notes. Crunchy is painting the walls right now. <laughs>、uh, yeah, I mean, I, I did note the lighting of that classroom because it was very specifically Shinbo esque once again. Th- th- this show is, you know, in a lot of ways Shaft esque, but very Shinbo esque too, with a lot of the lighting and a lot of the shots. But it's not even that. I don't think I can recall a single time throughout this block where Andy groped Fuko against her will. Like, he attempted it, like, once, and then, like, he immediately got his comeuppance. And it's like, oh my god, their dynamic is so much better when, when she isn't being groped against <laughs> her will constantly. I can't believe do you, it. Do you, do I you actually like seeing、scene? them together. No, the tickling scene was funny. I'm completely okay with that. Especially because they went all out with the facial expressions for Fuko in that scene. That was based. I'm completely okay with that.、Uh, but yeah, like, they, they got rid of the groping. My single biggest complaint about the show is gone now. Now I can like the characters being together、uh, more of the time. And their dynamic has improved.、Uh... Not that it was ever you know, poor before, but you know, seeing their dynamic and their relationship、uh, improve throughout this block of episodes,、uh, starting from you know, the whole Victor fight that we left off at the end of the last podcast, now going into this one, and then that、uh, you know, evolving into a, a cool moment where、uh, Andy considers taking out the card to bring Victor out to fight against、uh, On Repair and his、uh, best girl girlfriend. But uh, uh, Fugo reassures her, him that he, she's going to be all right and convinces him to you know, keep fighting on his own accord. There, there, there's a lot of little subtle things.、Uh, there's a lot of moments where Andy is just like, hey, I noticed that you're having like, a hard time or you,、like, you want to do something. Like, hey, we got time before this、uh, mission starts. You want to walk around Rio? Or, hey, do you, I see you want to go to the school because you didn't get a chance to have a school life when you, when you were younger. You want to walk around the school in school uniforms? Yeah, there's all sorts of little things to their dynamic. Even, you know, Andy having Fuko try on all the dresses and like ha- most of them are super, you know, I- exposing per se, which I was also okay with because, you know, it's just a dress. She's the one putting them on. And yeah, I've just enjoyed seeing them interact with each other in this specific block of episodes. And thought, I mean, it, there are also some 
like aside from the subtle stuff, some big jumps in development between the two, where now Fuko can will just kiss Andy on a whim. And you know, it's it's to the point where it's like, okay, when do they get together? Cause it, it, she's very clearly into him, uh, for the most part at this point. Uh, the, the kissing, I, I, I do enjoy the kissing. I just say, um, because I don't know another chance to bring this up. Uh, I've, I'm a little upset, a little disappointed that, uh, the randomness of Fuko's unluck powers, most of the time just being relegated to meteors. I was, I was like expecting some variety based on the environment and thinking like the meteorite would be like a rare occurrence. But uh, it's it just kind of feels like that's her her final boss move. Counterpoint: There's the one scene where Tatiana falls on Andy, which is the best thing ever. It it had me. It, in it, that 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 was fun. But I was yeah, just no, hoping I, I something more along agree. the lines of like uh, they're they're out at sea. Maybe it could, uh, like yeah. That, I know that killer whale works for them, but maybe like. A bunch of other killer whales or killer sharks could uh come and like jump and attack or uh like another like or an iceberg. They could just fucking like run to an iceberg that was out of nowhere. Yeah, because there's even one point in the fight with unrepair where you know their their plan is banking in part on the random element of Fuko's powers, and you know they they. Like, I, I'm pretty sure it's Andy who acknowledges, like, yeah, th this is based partially on luck. But then it's another meteorite, and I'm like, okay, well... I mean, I didn't even notice it while I was watching the episode, but now that you've pointed it out, yeah, there, it's seeming like that random element isn't so present anymore. At, at least that means it's canon that, if given the opportunity, Fuko could solo Madara, because she can also call down meteor meteors. Madara, I don't know who this is. Uh, we got uh, we gotta get you on to Naruto, buddy. Neon on his way to make all sorts of references that I don't understand because I haven't seen like half of the popular anime. Yeah, Crunchy on his way to reference Monogatari every podcast. True, true. I I do do that. Not every podcast, but fairly often, I guess. A good majority of them. <laughs> I wouldn't even say a majority of them, but that's neither here nor there. <clears throat> you get a pass on this one because this one's just inescapable with its influence. Yeah, so anyway, uh, what order did you want to cover this in? Like, chronological or just wherever the conversation flows? What, what are you feeling today? <clears throat> uh, we pretty much already covered the exciting extent of uh, the Victor fight that we left off last time where the uh, Union ra Roundtable comes to battle Andy as Victor, who is this, you know, unstoppable Super Saiyan version of Andy who can turn his uh, body parts into clones themselves to fight. Just makes him, like, the ultimate super soldier. That got resolved. Uh, and then the there was a horrible shower of purple Gatorade that was closing in on the both of them in the water. <laughs> Yeah, and your uh, worry last time that it would be showing off a bunch of powers and just kind of spoiling them, it does show them off, but it does not spoil what they negate, which I also like. So there's still quite a bit of mystery to how the members of the round table function. Although, uh, th this is getting me onto another topic of the leader's power in, uh, in particular, and... As well, how the show overall, like, the, the direction it's going. Because I, I don't think I realized the last block of episodes exactly where it was going. And now that I've gotten the full picture of what, you know, this show is going to be like in the future, I can safely say this show has one of the coolest concepts ever. Like, this show is just cool. Yeah, the, the power system in the show is, like, super sick. It's like... It's very JoJo-esque, where everyone has a very specific power with specific rules that they need to trigger to activate them. But uh, it, it's l like JoJo. The fun, half of the fun is seeing how the characters have to figure out how they work and then figure out the rules and work around them in order to win the day. Yeah, and that much was present from the first block. 
But even beyond that, which is already extremely cool, the premise of like what they're trying to do. So the point of like, the kill God, is baby, that, or JRPG. Well, man. yeah. <laughs> and so negators are people who break the rules of reality by their very nature. So they are outliers to the rules. And so this uh, that naturally means that the show itself is about br just bending the rules of reality to your whim. And the way this is done is through the book uh, Apocalypse. Basically, every time they complete a quest, they you know they get a reward for it and sometimes it's the location of unrepair but other times it's just casually unifying all of the world's languages which blew my mind when i saw it because i was like oh my god they're just gonna casually do it's like the how how flippantly they introduce the fact that there are no stars and then it comes back it, it pays off when they the uma galaxy it adds all the stars back in the sky, and then Earth gets invaded by aliens. This is a thing that happens, I, and it's resolved by a, my, like, in like a single episode. I think this is my favorite episode of the this entire block uh, so far, oh, just by virtue of it having like the coolest concepts. Like you know, the the unification of all languages to English is one thing, which you know I couldn't pick that they're not sticking to because. Not every single person is, you know, not not everyone is uh, sticking to it. Sometimes they break the rule, like with uh, the one girl who's like, oh, he's speaking Japanese. I can't understand it. Yeah, I mean, uh, we I can dive more into that, I guess, right now, since we're on the subject. Yeah, so the point is that they're all speaking English. Problem, the show is Japanese, you know, it's natively Japanese. And so in some scenes, the side characters will be speaking English. But in scenes where you're supposed to understand what the characters are saying, they're speaking Japanese. And it's a little weird to see the girl say, oh, I can't understand Nihongo. And then in Nihongo. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it, silly. It did like, crack me up do? quite a bit. At the very least, they did introduce technology where there's, like, this necktie that allows you to speak other languages. So you can just assume that when Unrepair understands them fully uh, in the final episode of this block, you can just assume he put on the necktie or has that technology now. Whereas before, you know, he had no idea what language they were even speaking. Yeah, and then I, bringing it back to UMA Galaxy... It's not just, you know, planets and stars and aliens that got added to the world. It's everything that comes with the concept. Because now that there's that was so a cool. sense of place. They even mentioned, like, myths and days of the week. We, we no noted this earlier in the last podcast. How it's like, it's weird that they always specify uh, what day it is, but never what day of the week it is. And they, uh, there were, I forget which character asked this, but uh, maybe it was, like, Andy or Victor, uh, who said that, uh, what what's a day of the week? Like what's a, what's a Tuesday? What the what the hecky are you talking about, dude? Uh, and then days of the week gets added like retroactively throughout history when UMA Galaxy gets added as a penalty. And so uh, Nico, the purple scientist dude, has to have his uh, non-negator uh, buddies in the science lab uh, download like all of human history that's different from what uh, Nico knew at that time. So it's like. Uh, hey, uh, yeah, by the way, myths and days of the week have now always been a thing, and just for negators exclusively, they don't understand what that is. Like, that's, that's such a fucking, odd, like, so cool, to, weird to think about. Yeah, and it even, like, it has ramifications where another one of the characters, Chikata, uh, he <laughs> just randomly, everyone in his school starts speaking English, and he doesn't know English. So he's just, like, in this fish-out-of-water scenario that's hilarious to actually watch unfold. Where it, it, well, like, it's such a nonsensical situation, but because of the logic of the show, like, it, this is just what happens. This is what the show's about, and that's so cool to me. I absolutely love this bending of reality's rules. I think that is, like, the single best and most interesting thing this show it, has to offer because it kind of makes me sad I that i haven't seen anything like this in fiction before 
it, it kind of makes me sad that we're joining this, uh, you know, the whole mechanic of, oh, if we accrue 101 penalties, then Ragnarok will occur and the world will end. Because I kind of want to see, like, new concepts be added to the world be when the UMAs get added. Like, if, if a, a gap, like... The, the, like, uh, for example, this uh, new one, the, the hundredth penalty will be the, if they fail these four quests at the end of this uh, block of episodes, uh, there'll be the addition of the UMA revolution, which it implies that the Earth does not revolve around the sun, which implies that they're like the seasons, like the changing seasons as we know it don't exist and that the planet is just a fixed position away uh, from the Earth, meaning that if you live on the side, on the opposite side of the sun, you are just stuck in a forever winter. That would, uh, will almost certainly be cool to see unfold. And another thing I want to point out in regards to how late we're joining the whole orb system, where, you know, you have 101 penalties, and you, you put in the, the circle whenever you get another penalty. I found it a little strange how we're, we were so close to 101 penalties without even knowing it at first and then they get another penalty and then they start worrying about how close they are and let our characters know how important that is when that feels like something you'd tell them uh immediately that feels like the first thing you'd brief everyone on oh yeah we're near the apocalypse you well, you really need to complete these quests guys it, it's it's a big deal but nah it's just kind of thrown out there after they get yet another penalty. I feel like they should have started worrying a lot more like 10 penalties ago. Hey, it's okay. It won't be the last insanely questionable writing decision that they make this block oh, there, of episodes. There, there are plenty of nonsensical moments. And I know mostly noticed small things. You might have noticed something that I didn't. But... Yeah, I mean, we can nitpick all we want uh, later on in the podcast. Or right now, if you want to delve into that. Uh, I I'll, say we I'll save my biggest one that I'm sure you probably agree with me, uh, at least to some degree, uh, for the end of it. But for, for now, I say we just move on with the, with the Unrepair arc. Alright, so Unrepair is what basically the big bad of this arc. And he's a dude, his power is basically, if he wounds you, you cannot repair it. And so, yeah, that's kind of a big deal when he can cut Andy, and then that cut will stay there. Asterisk, there was, I actually didn't get the logic behind him repairing his neck. Uh, I, I, I think he just unactivated the powers, but I don't think I picked up on that at first. Uh... I don't understand Unrepair's ability. Uh, I think they're still keeping a lot of the cards close to their chest about him, because, like, there's a, the thing where he licks uh, his eye. He's got an eye patch on, and the eye w w that's, cover that's being covered is constantly bleeding. And it seems like whenever he licks his own blood from the wound, he gets really fast all of a sudden. Uh, don't don't know what he's negating to do that, but yeah, I guess that that uh, is a power that I he has. I didn't notice that actually. I just assumed it was, uh, j just a design quirk of him. Like, oh, wouldn't it be cool if his eye is perpetually bleeding? See, I didn't notice. Him I, and there up there are multiple time times like where he moves so fast that uh, uh, like like those guys who he uh at when we are first introduced to him. And he cuts those uh, mafia dudes' necks and their carotid arteries with his uh, scalpels. They're like, uh, how did he move so fast? How did he cut us so fast? And, uh, I when feel like he... whenever I see a character move fast in a shonen, my brain just autocorrects it to, yeah, it's a shonen, people do that. <laughs> I, I feel like they brought special attention, because even, even Andy is like, damn, they, they're fast, dude. Yeah, you're probably right about that. Yeah, so then that, then, but then it, this is the thing that really fucks me up, is that he explicitly says uh, that his unrepairability works, will work on a target so long as, uh, like, is, it, the wound will forever be unrepairable unless he dies. Then the ability will undo itself. It, uh, like, there are several instances we see with Andy where he 
uh, is still able to use his regeneration ability and repair his body despite him cutting him. Yeah, I mean, once again, I just assume he... Okay, what I think is going on, and I might be for uh, blanking on some moment that contradicts this, but how I rectified it in my head was... If the ability is still active, only him dying will deactivate the ability. But because, like, he can still deactivate it at will. And so whenever he's regenerating, like the, the cut to his neck at the beginning, for example, it's just him deactivating, uh, deactivating the ability. But why would he deactivate it? <laughs> Although... Oh god, that, but that's contradicted. Hold on, no, I'm being silly. Because Fuko still has the wound on her that doesn't repair. But Andy's is repaired for some reason. Yeah, I, so I now, was expecting I, now the I'm fight. clueless. I, I was expecting the fight to have this uh, dynamic of, hey, uh, Andy's entire uh, fighting style of shooting off and cutting off parts of his body to uh, attack him is now, like, rendered as a, a limited resource because, like, he, he still would be able to shoot off his fingers and arms and whatnot, but he wouldn't be able to grow new ones back, so he had to be a lot more Well, hold on, no, I, I feel like you're uses. missing something here because it's only the wounds that unrepair does on him that can't Yeah, that, yeah that, that, that I get, but uh, I, I figured that he would, you know, cut him with his uh, blades enough to, especially when he, they introduced this... Uh, the the blade runner uh, artifact that he has that just shoots out uh blades when he kicks don't get like the, the logic behind that I, we don't exactly know how artifacts work outside of them just i guess being magic yeah i mean that that didn't really raise an eyebrow for me because i was just like eh it's a thing it, it, it it's magic you can just assume it's some kind of supernatural ability or whatever cuz that's the nature of artifacts like the the stick that grows very long i that i didn't try to make that sus it just kind of happened but i i guess yeah like it, it it made sense to me i just i just found it a little silly that like oh all of a sudden not not only does he have jet boots but those same jet boots can uh he can kick out big uh razor blades out of them I like, did it's fun. Find it's it cool. A little I just, it, I, I was just like, damn, like to... so. We're, we're just pulling that one out, huh? I mean, they do kind of add in a fairly retconny uh, solution to this, which is, oh, how did he get on the boat? He flew on. That makes sense. So I thought it, they it was got onto the boat. Me... I thought they got into the boat because of the whale. That could also be... Uh, uh, the whale, I do not get whatsoever. That was... <laughs> I, I feel like that's what you were talking about with the big eyebrow raising thing. Where it's like, uh, how well, are those no, dudes I mean, alive? I, I don't know what that says about me, that I bought into the whale being their mode of transportation more than uh, them being able to kick giant ra uh, guillotine blades at people. <laughs> well, my, my issue... Even the whale Maybe I just got isn't dumb that big brain. of a deal to me. It's it's why it's why the other dudes are alive. Cause I can only assume the whale has something to do with how they're still alive. But how? Tatiana blew them up. They, they uh, should be well, in to hell be, right to now. To be fair, to be fair, we only see uh the the machine gun dude's arm get like erased by Tatiana's ability. Uh, but they are shown to be running away from it. We don't see them get 100% caught into it, so I'll give the show a pass on that one. I found it a little a, a little sussy that we spend an entire episode building up to that big attack that will presumably knock them out, and then they're just alive afterwards, when the clear implication, to me at least, was, oh, there's no way they fucking survived that. I mean, Andy had to run up to the top floor of the ship before like before she can even unleash the attack but and there, like, there was no way those guys, especially the hooded dude who was we have no idea what his ability uh is yet uh there's no way they'd kill those characters off before we get a chance to figure that out i, I guess but i don't know I, I i didn't really i i still have question marks in my head about that 
Uh, my my question is uh. The Ch Chikara's power, uh, unmove, where if he looks at you, if he's got you in his line of sight, uh, you can't move. Isn't that, like, literally Shen's ability, but, like, Yeah, that was my exact first thought when I saw that. Because, alright, so the only difference between their abilities is the method of activation. So for Shen, it's if he likes the opponent, uh, and likes fighting them, and has respect for their abilities and whatnot. Whereas for Chikara, he has to be completely immobile himself and have them in his line of sight. And he, oh, and also it, I'm, I'm pretty sure the way it works and another difference, he doesn't just freeze the opponent, he freezes the thing, like just everything in his line of sight, go, it just completely freezes. And I'm pretty sure that's another distinction between the two. But uh, yeah, I, other than I, I, that, I also remember Shen yeah. having the ability to make people uh like mirror their movements or like take the opposite action of what they were going to do. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, no, no, you're completely right about that. But most but I, often, I also distinctly remember them. Shen using that ability sometimes to just freeze a person in place. He in this block of episodes, he uses it on uh Victor to keep a, hold him still to let the meteor shower hit him. Yeah, so, like, most of the time when the ability is being used, it's basically just to freeze people, because it's doing the opposite of what they want to do, and that means they can't move, which is or they move literally backwards. the same. Or they move backwards, yeah. And that that's really similar to Chikata's ab uh, ability. I don't know, it feels a bit repetitious, compared, you know, compared to most of the other abilities, which are completely new and unique and uh for the most part completely insane i, I like how Juiz's ability uh on justice just uh negates your sense of justice by in a way kind of doing also what shen does uh making you take an opposite uh choice of what you want wanted to do but instead of it being an action it's more of your uh your cause for for instance, uh, when those aliens show up, when UMA Galaxy gets uh, added to the universe and introduces the concept of aliens, uh, Juiz utilizes he looks at the the alien and utilizes their unjustice ability to uh, reverse their sense of justice because their 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 home world for these aliens uh, was dying and they needed to find a new place to call their home and Earth just happened to so fit the glove, so they were like. Uh, l listen, it, for my friends and families to survive, my entire race, uh, we need to claim your planet in the name of our alien species. That, that, that is justice. And she's like, oh, alright, bet. And so she activates her ability and then turns that on its head being like, oh, okay, what if I just made all of your, uh, friends and family and your entire species turn on each other and, uh, drive yourself into extinction? Unjustice is probably my favorite ability, aside from obviously unlock and undead both of those are obviously the goat because they're the main two abilities but unjustice is rad like that, specifically because she is the leader that she has her own strong sense of justice that she is you know trying to kill god and she thinks that is the right thing to do where even if it requires all these negator lives to be lost it's nonetheless justice because you know, those lives were deemed necessary to be lost in order to overtake God. And, and yet when Billy the... wants to do it, it's not okay. <laughs> uh, well, the explanation. Or hold on, which one was Billy again? <laughs> <laughs> you don't remember who Billy? Uh, he was the, uh, the sh g gun, gun guy who betrayed them all at the Billy end. Billy is the gun guy. Uh, the gun guy. So, on the side of unrepair? Yeah. Yeah, well, the, the rationale behind that is, oh, well, they're not trying to kill God. They're just trying to, you know, become dominant over humans and recruiting everyone to their side possible, and if they're too weak, they just kill them off because it's like, well, why even bother? You know, they're trying to reverse what they see as well no he, he explicitly order. says hey in order to hunt down the the umas based off the seasons that we're hunting now uh wouldn't it just be easier and faster and like guarantee success uh to avoid the 100th penalty to just 
drop a few nukes on their locations. Yeah, it may kill many innocent people, but you know, it'll save the lives of the rest of them. Sacrifice the few for the many. True. I, I'm literally blanking on this. I don't remember a single thing about what you're describing. You watched episode 16, right? Wait, we were supposed to watch episode 16? I stopped at 15. Oh, what the fuck? <laughs> okay, you stopped at a... Wait, what? <laughs> uh no it says right there it said the whole time 9 through 16 because that's eight episodes and the show is 24 episodes long and we watched the first episode on the season that it came out for the impression podcast we watched two uh through eight for the uh because that's seven episodes that makes one third of the series in the first block nine through 16 for the second then 17 through 24 will make up the the final third when the next time we talk about this show when those episodes come out okay so it's relieving to know i don't have dementia it is not relieving to know i now have dyslexia <laughs> all right wow you uh you dropped out at a crazy time because uh they i i guess we'll we'll jump back to to the unrepair arc in just a bit but uh now it's, it, it's, I guess this is going to be fun to explain to you. You'll just have to watch it when, uh -oh. when uh, we come back to the show. So, uh, you know how Billy is the guy who uh, feeds Tatiana the, the long cake to, uh, you know, befriend her and get her to join the union? Yes. Okay, turns out he's actually evil. Oh, fun. Uh, and yeah, it, it, his uh, betrayal is rushed and comes out of nowhere. Uh, I mean, yeah, so... because he's not really a character right now. He's the guy who gave Tatiana the long suite, and it was really cute, and you liked him for that one scene, and then he did nothing else of note. That's, that's probably why I forgot who he was. Yeah, no, that was the only thing he has done... That has mattered to the show, to the narrative. And uh, now all of a sudden he's uh, actually, not only is he working with Under, he's actually the leader of Under. I see. That's one hell of a revelation to drop in a single episode. I mean, maybe they built up to it well within that episode? <laughs> nope. <that> feels... <laughs> nope. Okay, good to know. There's, there's one like moment something... where... There's, there's one moment where... Uh, uh, at the very start of it, where Billy is walking down the the hallway on their way to the roundtable meeting with Tatiana, and he's wearing his spurs, and Tatiana says, Hey, Mr. Billy, why are you wearing your spurs that help you see by uh, letting your sound bounce off the, the walls so you can, you know, ec I guess, echolocation sonar your, your way around like a bat. Uh, you don't need that. You have me. I'm, I, I, I can help you around when you're... Because he's blind. Yeah. Uh, or, or not, because that might be a lie. Uh, because it, he was able to see just fine with uh, uh, fighting everyone else. So... He was like, yeah, I know. I've got you, Tatiana. And, like, it's framed a little menacingly, but, like... Not so enough to say it. This reveal doesn't work because, like, he, he's not a character, at least not one that we are like. I'm not surprised that he's a traitor. I'm not betrayed because I all I know is that he's the guy who saved Tatiana that one time. But he that's a thing he's done in the past, but like in the narrative, in the off screen narrative that you know is not the present, it's just a thing he had done that we are shown via flashback through Tatiana, but. That he has not done anything for the active narrative. Now all of a sudden, the first thing he does is reveal himself to be uh, the closest thing we have to a big bad uh, outside of God himself. Yeah, I mean, the, the way you're describing it, it's just like, I don't see, <laughs> I don't think this would remotely work because the, the coolest thing about a betrayal, right, is that you're building, for, for so long you think, Oh, they're innocent, they're cool, they're, you know, a badass, and then they turn out to be evil the entire time. Like, uh, an example would be from Bleach. I'm not gonna name names for spoiler reasons, but you know who I'm talking about. And, you know... Orihime, granted, that bitch, <laughs> turned her back on all the, our beloved characters. 
<laughs> oh, I can't believe Orihime would do such a thing. But, yeah, like, that character from Bleach was an effective enough betrayal arc. And it could have even been better in that one. Could have had more hints leading up to it. Could have had him, you know, be even more... Uh, of a character you love and know well, or whatever. Bro, but that was still the, the character in Bleach that happens that you're talking about is like Julius Caesar compared to this reveal, where it just happens. <laughs> it, it, it's like, uh, it, it's almost like, you know, the modern Disney movies where they have like, uh, the, you know, it's Johnson Smith, the, the CEO that was there that one time. He was actually the big villain all along, even though he was never well, really a I character until now. Well, I can't believe it. <laughs> so yeah uh, i haven't seen the episode unfortunately so i can't mold about this with you but it sounds shit uh I'll, I'll give it this the scene itself is presented in a cool way like if they had done that exact same scene but just had in slotted uh uh you know uh, an arc with billy so that way we could at least get attached to him in even any remote possible sense outside of, you know, a flashback of him helping Tatiana. Uh, if we could have that, then it would hit at least any amount as opposed to the reveal itself being like, oh, no, you you backstabbed Tatiana and everyone else, I guess. Like, in like Tatiana is obviously, like, really betrayed and upset uh, because uh, Billy was, like, the person who brought her back to uh society and from you know suicidal ideation but like it's the old that's the only emotional beat that it hits everyone else is just like oh billy how could you and it's like yeah hey i, I guess <laughs> now and it, it, it's set it's saved by the presentation of uh a giant fire monster coming out and ripping the round table out from the room and it, uh, Rip and Latla riding onto it and uh, escaping through the ceiling while uh, Fuko and Andy chase after them. Yeah, so... I mean, once again, haven't seen the episode, can't comment too much, but it sounds like I'm agreeing with you. Yeah, and <laughs> uh, even in... Uh, I'll, I'll, yeah, one more parallel to Bleach, now that, now that I think about it, and, and because you brought it up, uh, the character loses... Uh, what they wear on their face and uh, and becomes a lot more evil looking because of it. I see. Uh, and also, see. It, it, on top of that, wait, wait, to throw one more uh, reference, you go, actually, now that you brought this up and now that I'm comparing both scenes in my head, this is almost like one for one what happens, just, you know, Bleach did it better, which is something I can't believe I'm saying. Um... Uh, yeah, we find out that uh, Billy has a secret power that he's been keeping uh, a secret from the rest of the other members of the round table. What we thought was his ability uh, that Tatiana described as unbelievable, whereas uh, even though he's blind, if he shoots his guns at a like away from the, his intended target in a way that looks like there's no way that it, they could possibly hit, they'll just ricochet off of any like the walls and surfaces and whatnot. And they'll uh, bounce towards their target. Uh, it in actuality, I guess that was a, an ability he picked up along the way. His real ability, uh, well, not one hundred percent explained yet. Uh, just going off of what the show has given us through context, is called unfair. And true to its namesake, it is fucking boosted. Because what it essentially does uh, in the episode is that it allows him to stockpile and copy other people's abilities. Like, he was able to copy Tops Unstoppable, that lets him run really fast. He was able to copy uh, Undead, that let him regenerate from having his neck broken. And he was even able to copy uh, Unjustice and uh, make everyone uh, turn their weapons against each other, or turn their, uh, their actions against each other. Hold on, this, this has to have, like, some kind of Achilles heel. Cause that is cracked. That is that is busted. That is broken. Yeah, there, there's bro, no this, way there's not like some bro could huge solo Gojo in, in one shot. He, he he could copy Limitless. He could copy Unlimited Void. I mean, I, I'm assuming it, it copy has Hollow to Purple. be the it it has to be the case that it has like some giant, you know, 
uh, some huge weakness that we just don't know about yet, and that we're saving for it, later surely, to make him seem stronger than he is. Because the only no thing, way I, the only one I can give think someone of that ability. The only one I can think of right now is that looks like he can only copy one ability at a time. Like he, we don't well, see him. That was the first use... one that came to my mind. But that's still way too busted because everyone else has one ability at a time. Yeah, like whenever he wants to like uh, switch to something that repair damage, you can just copy undead, and it looks like I don't know what the conditions are need to be required in order to like copy the ability if they have to be present in the room. But from the way he words it, he it sounds like that he has to he can take abilities for himself. So uh, it sounds like. Unless stated otherwise, later on the show, from what I can tell right now, from the way he talks in the episode, he can he now has access to unjustice, un uh undead, and unstoppable whenever he wants. You know, the the more you describe it, the more I'm thinking they should have just kept it at unbelievable. Because I I heard that ability and imme- uh, and immediately thought. That's the coolest fucking thing ever. He can, like, being able to fire a gun in any direction and the bullet just inexplicably ricochets to kill people. And, like, the, you know, the handicap being that he's blind and so he kind of needs to rely on that ability. Like, that's, that's badass. I love a fight with that guy. Yeah, but now, presumably, that was just an ability he picked up along the way. Yeah. So, uh... Uh and other, well, I I really did miss out on a lot. Holy yeah, shit. you 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 missed out on quite a bit. <laughs> well, I'm gonna have fun watching that episode. It, it, it's probably still a good time, even with all that we're sort of in disbelief. Over. It, it's it's the cra- It's the uh, worst bit of writing in the, in the show so far. If we're talking like narrative uh, twists, because like it's a on its own. Like, if taken in a vacuum, it's not, like, the worst idea in the world. It's just a, a good idea horribly executed, because there's no... There was no setup. It's just we're jumping straight into the twist without any build-up to the twist. Yeah, but even still, I, I imagine watching something cool that, granted, should have been cooler, but, you know, it's still cool at the end of the day. It's still entertaining fiction, even if it is poorly set up and executed on yeah it it, it 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 hopefully the show will go on to rectify it and explain it uh yeah yeah so yeah, basically billy uh when they were being presented with those new quests because they're they're tasked with four quests and each one of them is to hunt down a uma based on the seasons like there's one uh autumn winter spring summer uh uma and uh they each grant different uh rewards uh, but, you know, failure to do them will bring the 100th penalty in. And they have the locations of each one. So Billy was like, hey, uh, we're getting, like, pretty close to, uh, you know, 101. And, like, if that world ends, we're all fucked and everyone will die. So what if we just drop nukes on these people, like, like on the UMA, the, the location of the UMA? And if a few thousand people die each, you know... If they'll save everyone else literally ever, so be it, right? Is that not worth it? That is actually an interesting moral conundrum because, okay, something I like that Undead Unluck is building up in the background and that this furthers now that I'm hearing it is the question of whether or not the round table and what they're doing is ethical. Because at the beginning, it's framed as horrible. Oh, they're, they're just killing innocent negators why would they do such a thing then it's framed as oh well actually we're killing god these are necessary lives if we don't do this the world will end and so we need to do this right we're, we're kind of stuck uh, between a rock and a hard place so to speak where we don't actually want to kill negators but we kind of have to our, our hands are tied here and so then fuko upon seeing you know these negators being sold like items and props to be just put in a mansion somewhere with some rich person just checking in on them every once in a while and probably leading a horrible existence as property. Now, Fuka genuinely considers, well, what's better? We kill them for the sake of making sure we can kill God and be free of these rules, or them just living with some dude, you know? Like, what's... Sure, it's horrible and dehumanizing, but it's better than death, isn't it? And Andy's response to that is, yeah, however, 
um, actually here, we're killing God and that's badass and we should totally, like, do that, dude. And so it is interesting to consider the idea of, well, you know, maybe just nuking them outright, maybe that would be the best option because, sure, a few thousand people die, but the apocalypse is averted. Although my immediately, uh, immediate answer to that would be well how many times are you gonna just nuke people because you can uh you can only do that so many times before the government starts to like crack down on your whole operation and be like hey yo maybe you shouldn't nuke people you know maybe because it's implied heavily that uh fucking negators are mostly secretive there's no well-tread path of them being introduced back into society or living normal lives they are very much by their lonesome, unknown, nobody knows how these powers work. I think Most people don't the even union know that is they like exist. their own shadow government, right? They have the ability to yeah. wipe your your memory of uh, a negator from like everyone that's ever met you at the drop of a hat, at the push of a Although button. Although I guess depending on how powerful that memory magic is, because I mean, entire cities have gone under with a zombie apocalypse. So now that now that you mention, now that you remind me of the memory stuff. Maybe they could get away with nuking a city. Now, maybe that would be plausible. But I'm just not sure because how we can drop a nuke is. on a city doesn't mean we should. Is, yeah, that's also the conundrum where, okay, how many thousand, like, when does the death toll reach like 100,000 from these nukes? How many inhospitable areas do we create from nuclear radiation? Should it only be a last resort? Uh, because that's certainly better than being one step closer to uh, to the apocalypse. So, like, do we try to get the negator first on our own, but then if it fails, we use the nuke, but then we might not know their location? It is a legitimately interesting quandary. And I, I, I like the idea of this uh, moral quandary, because you know me, ideological conflicts uh, give me lifeblood. But I just wish that we were able to get to this conflict without needing to sacrifice uh, good writing. <laughs> yeah, that, that's sort of what this all hinges on, even though, you know, my brain is being assimilated from all these moral quandaries and ideas, but at the same time, you know, <laughs> that doesn't necessarily justify making Billy a big bad after, like, uh, precisely one scene of development. Uh, speaking of justifying doing evil uh, b uh, for seemingly unclear reasons, uh, I guess we we can end the podcast by talking about uh, Rip and finishing up the unrepair arc because we had to take that wildly unexpected but uh, hilarious detour. <laughs> All right, so Rip and uh, Latla, you said, right? Uh, their yeah. ideology is Who is that... best girl, by the way? Oh, I mean, they put her in the sexiest outfit possible. Like, they, they went... <laughs> the, the, I know this joke has been well-tread, but fellas, the author was writing... Was drawing her with one hand. Uh, insane. Yeah. They, he also but, gave her the funniest personality for no reason. Yeah, I, I ship her and Rip. They, they're a great villain couple. There, there, there's them. a moment in the design. last episode that you didn't watch where uh, when Rip and At Latla were riding on uh, the giant fire golem that they uh, ride in on, uh, Fuka was like, oh my god, it's Rip and his wife. And then it's like, oh, is that what we look? Rip's like, oh, is that what we look like? And then Latla just leans over and hilariously slaps him across the face. And he goes, it's not like that at all. Oh, it's totally like that in Latla's mind, I presume. Or at least... Or at, or at the very least, they're getting there. Like she, well, she, she wasn't, like, blushing when she did that. She was just like, uh, like, fuck you, man. She was like a, like a look of uh, annoyance. Well, hey, hold on. If I was in love with someone and they said, yeah, we're not like that, I'd be a bit annoyed. I, I can understand her just looking annoyed instead of blushing. Uh, but anyway... Their ideology is, listen, this, this bitch god, you ain't killing him. Have you seen that dude? He kind of freaky looking, he's scary, he can decimate entire cities and whatnot. Uh, you're out of your, uh, out of your element, man. And so, before the apocalypse hits, we're just gonna do everything in our power to reverse the current state of affairs. 
us negators are going to be on top and humanity on bottom. We're going to cause chaos. We're going to you know, reverse the order to bring, fi bring things back to their natural state. Right, right before we die in the apocalypse, uh, once we hit 101 penalties. And that, that's their sense of justice and what's right in the world, how, you know, we've been... Because they're very much of the opinion, like, oh, society has wronged us, there's no societal, you know, no method by which we can lead normal lives in the current state of affairs. And I... Now that I think about it, I hadn't considered this before, but it's almost certainly negators who created the society where negators have terrible lives, right? Because they're the ones with the memory magic. It, certainly, with how long negators have been a thing, you know, without the memory magic, humanity would have figured it out and would have suffered the social consequences which i say suffered it probably creates some kind of method for negators to be accepted and normalized within society well the like, par so part wonder... of their par part of their deal is that uh you know a lot of negators hate the fact that they're negators because uh usually that causes a lot of problems for, the for themselves and they can't live normal lives see uh fuko Tatiana Ch and Chikara, who all have in common that the when, right when their powers activated for the first time, it all caused the deaths of their parents, with Fuko at the airport, Tatiana on her fifth birthday, and uh, Chikara just going home from the grocery store and then looking back at his parents at a crosswalk and accidentally freezing them in place for a truck to run them over. It's, like, it's, it's almost hilarious how unfortunate the timing of these abilities activate at the most opportune parents killing times like why can't someone just be taking a shit one day when they get access to their power <laughs> i'd love for that to be the next backstory yeah i was taking a dump and then the toilet exploded and uh shit got real weird after that and i was a negator suddenly but yeah, yeah like, I, I just love that killing like, their own parents is yeah, the trend. that's that's the common it's always line. their parents <laughs> it can never be like a love like a like a best friend or a like a, a wife or a husband nope your parents both of them gone and you but what killed i wonder them. what i wonder is uh like w what if sometime in the past negators were known by humanity and humanity decided they're too powerful we're gonna you know try and keep them down kill them there is already evidence of humans treating negators like shit and so i wonder if that's maybe part of the reason why they hide in the shadows and function as you yeah, said the, like a shadow government there is a mafia that knows about the existence of uh negators and umas and whatnot they they don't 100 percent understand what they are like i think they call them cryptids instead of umas uh, but they do know that they exist, and they are able to capture them and auction them off. So they must have, like, some way to combat them. Yeah, and... Th I mean, that's probably... If I just have to use my uh, media literacy beam right now, uh, I, I can... Uh, I am predicting that that is the case. That at some point, it was deemed that memory magic is a necessity in order to be able to survive with humans and you no know, maybe that's not so accurate after all maybe there is a way for them to coexist although more likely we're probably just going to kill god and have negators be you know no longer negators so that their powers don't randomly kill people or maybe everyone can be negators who knows <laughs> when everyone's uh, a negator no one will be <laughs> And, and this, this is the, the diametric opposition between the Union and Under, whereas the Union wants to kill God so they can bring an end to negators and the rules and whatnot so they can all just live normal lives again uh, and be free from the you know, oppression that's been put on them unfairly. Uh, and Under just wants to be like, hey, you know what? If we're stuck like this uh, with powers that we weren't like didn't choose to have or were just born with, thrust upon us by an uncaring god you know what like why fight it right why not just like live our lives uh like the way we want to because like 
our powers, yeah, they may have caused uh, horrible things to happen to us, but uh, they kind of just objectively make us better than the people around us. So uh, let's just, uh, m like, you know, mutant brotherhood Magneto this shit and just rule the world. Yeah, and this is, like you said, where the conflict arises. And so far, uh, I'm not sure exactly what to think of this ideological conflict. Because it is cool that they do have opposing ideologies at all. There's not necessarily one that I'm, you know, that gets my brain as a worrying as some other ones. Like, for example, Call of the Night with Anko Iguisu. But it's still a fun dichotomy. I, th I think the one pitfall that I have with Under is that, like, they, they are explicitly like, Hey, you know what? Like killing God, uh, you like good luck, buddy. The uh, well, wh wh why even fight it? Why not? Let's just rule the world in the time that we have left. I feel like that just kind of takes the wind out of their sails because, like, their their final goal won't even like have lasting consequences if the world ends. That is true. So it's like it's kind of uh, like the characters. Oh, go ahead. I, I was just gonna say it's kind it's it it it, it, it kind of you know, knocks the intimidation out of them just a little bit, or at least the loftiness of their goals to be like, yeah, we're evil, fuck, like, nor normies, fuck the normos, we're just gonna rule this world because we deserve it, because we're just better than the normies. Uh, and then it's just like, yeah, but what happens when, you know, God, uh, you know, comes down and smites us all with his uh, holy sword and whatever? I just like, I don't know, yeah, we had a good run. Yeah, because explicitly, the world is going to end in, like, seven or eight months. Because it's September now in the show, where I left off at the very least. And Andy, Well, I'll tell you this, you know, it's now December. Going, oh, fuck. Wait, oh, oh. <laughs> wait, wait, what? <laughs> wait, 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 wait. wait. Uh, we had wait, a, a two-month time Why did we jump ahead skin. so much? That that's uh, kind of Fuko sudden. got trained in martial arts off screen, apparently. What? Wait, what? Hold on. That was uh, you, I was you know, so excited for that. Yeah, you, you, well, uh, <laughs> may, maybe her training isn't complete, but she does say there is a joke that uh when Rip arrives and looks at Fuko, he's like, "Hey, Fuko, it's been a while. Have you lost weight?" And Fuko at first is like, you know, blushing, laughing, be like, "Oh yeah, you know what? I've been training this past two months, so." Yeah, I did a, a little exercise, and Rip's like, oh, but maybe I can't actually tell because I'm really high up and you're really down there, so maybe maybe I'm just, like, uh, you didn't lose any weight. And Fuko, like, gets really mad and starts, like, uh, with vein marks on her head, pounding at Andy's head in anger. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I, I just want to see the training arc. Like, seeing the training yeah, uh, is I, so cool I to hope me. that her training is not complete, but I, I will be... An insanely disappointed. I I wrote at the end of that episode in my notes. Fuko asks Andy to teach her how to fight. Let's fucking go! Like finally, like That's, the hold on. Let me read my exact note because I wrote something extremely similar, almost certainly. Uh, let's see. Okay, I guess I didn't write something similar. I guess I just had the. Oh no, I just took the screenshot and put it in my notes because I was too lazy to write anything. But I was thinking all that in my head. Because the training, the training arc is so gratifying, where you get to see a character struggle, then they overcome it, then they are stronger. It is like the most basic form of satisfying narrative storytelling. And it's not seeing that is just kind of, but why? Yeah, it we are, feels we are like only it, told it feels like that two months have passed, and she has been training. We've never see, we never see a bit of that training uh, in the episodes that we are covering here. Maybe that it changes in the like, later episodes, but it feels like because you you know you're describing this time skip. It feels like we should have just existed throughout that period of time to build up Billy as a character and have Fuko train and actually see that happen. Because that's all cool stuff that would have been super important to you know have this betrayal arc. I guess. You want to know what it is? It's this show being impatient and wanting to get to the good stuff as quickly as possible. Assuming that the road to get there isn't as interesting as the final product. When in actuality, the road to get there is what makes the product, 
you know, infinitely more fun. To <laughs> cough, cough, Jujutsu Kaisen, cough, cough, Shibuya Incident yeah. Arc. <laughs> I mean, even that isn't quite as... At least in that show, you do get the sense that Yuji is like, you know, it's not necessarily a training arc, but each fight he's learning something new about his powers, and you get to see that growth. Whereas, you no, know, so... Because the point of the training arc is, well, Fuko hasn't really grown as a fighter in this time. She's just kind of, you know, getting... She's, she's gotten getting better brave. at kissing she Andy. Cut off, she's gotten better at kissing Andy and cutting his head off. And that's about it. And so to see that training arc, it's like something that I haven't seen yet from this show. That is a new thing, you know, whereas in Jujutsu Kaisen, at the very least, that was like a consistent thing even the stuff with him well I, I i say there wasn't a training arc there actually was which was him just watching movies which is why it didn't feel like one and why it didn't occur to me at first but that even that was still satisfying to see him like oh he watched the, uh, these movies and controlled his powers and now he can use them better whereas in this it's just like well uh, <laughs> it's just a time skip and now i can do kung fu we 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 haven't seen her thrown any punches yet, so we don't. Uh, I'll, I'll give it the benefit of the doubt, but uh, if she is I able to, just, I just have the sneaky do kung fu <laughs> just out of the blue. I will be immensely disappointed. <laughs> I I hope we're not done with the training, but something tells me we probably are, and that's there's sad. there's no way this bitch learned kung fu martial arts in two months, even with the union training her. When she's just a fucking high school age 18 year old girl. Well, let's hope for the best, you know. Ho hopefully we can hopefully we can come into the next podcast and be like, hey yo, that was the best train and arc of all time. Uh, we we were wrong to even doubt it for a second. Undead Unlock really is the goat. Yeah, and uh I, I, I at the end of the whole unrepair battle, uh uh Andy is able to blast open rip's heart which uh it's according to him says it killed him but then he comes back as a a younger boy uh is that explained in episode 16 nope <laughs> nope it has not been explained as of episode at the end of episode 15 i was like okay kind of weird that we don't have any explanation for why he's back and apparently he can also like he's going to grow up so he's he's gonna grow up. Yeah, and have he all his says that he's only gonna be, be like that usual. for a, a while, not forever. Yeah, and so, uh, you know what? It's probably just them holding their cards close to their chest again. It's probably one. Oh, you you want to know what it is? You were mentioning that the other dude, uh, like the other two negators that were with them. We don't know what their powers are yet. I mean, one of them can summon weapons out of thin air, so it's probably the cloaked dude's power that allowed that to happen. Maybe. We, we know that Latla uh, has some kind of ability that uh, negates attacks that are coming her way by forcing them to miss. Um, if she, if she well, thinks that, that they're one, coming I her way. Well, that one, I get the logic... Uh, that, yeah, that one I get the logic behind, where, you know, if she is aware of its presence, she, you know, they, they all miss her. So it can't be her powers, I think. It'd have to be the cloaked dudes, I imagine. Because that's the only one that makes sense. Probably. I, I so desperately want to know what the little girl in the giant pink bunny suit's power is and why she's on their side. Uh, yeah, I got jump scare. Uh, child jump scare. Uh, <laughs> lolly jump scare. 15. <laughs> Speaking of lolly jump scare... Uh, Tatiana is unironically one of my favorite characters in this show. Like, even oh, before course, she was revealed- The naked lolly with the long hair. No, hold hair. on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> before oh, hold on, I knew- officer. I can explain. <laughs> uh, this officer, sir, even before she was revealed to be a lolly, uh, she was still one of my favorite characters. Because I love the idea of this giant robot with a cute girl's voice. <laughs> this just, just the, the the juxtaposition between those elements is great to me and obviously we do get her backstory and an entire episode dedicated to just this one attack that she does that i really liked it was probably my favorite episode of the fight because it just had so much build up to this one attack that's something that i do quite like we learn about her relationship with fuko which is extremely post hoc 
but still enjoyable to see. Uh, extremely, uh, extremely post hoc still, which feels a little awkward. Like, okay, why wasn't this indicated at all before this point? But whatever, it makes for a good episode and one that I found extremely compelling. Yeah, I also love how, uh, with her ability, when she when she leaves her orb, she uh, her untouchable ability like forces away everything to the point where she can walk on water. I I was a little confused on like the potency of, if she could control the potency of it or not because when she lets it loose, it, like it was for the first time she kills her parents, but then like destroys their house. Then she uh, when she lets it loose again, she cuts off that one dude's arm. Uh, but then when uh she's just like using it normally, they, it allows Fuko and Chikara to just stand on it like a like a giant ball while she walks forward like a platform. I thought it was just like you straight up if you tried to touch her, you would just like get crushed. I guess it's a few variations of it where you know sometimes it kills people and other times you can stand on it. I, I guess they need to explain the logic a little more because right now it's a little unclear. A lot of these powers are pretty unclear as of right now. Th uh, that's a bit of a theme in this show I'm noticing. Yeah. But she she is a cool character and it is going to probably she might have the best uh, arc in this later uh, block of episodes seeing how now she's going to be forced to fight against uh, the man who pretty much saved her life. Yeah, I'm really excited to see more of her. She's, yeah, probably my third favorite character of the show so far. Uh, I, I want did, a Nindroid am I the, of a robot. <laughs> am I the only one who found it funny when at the beginning of episode 15, there's this whole conundrum of, will Chikara join the team or will he not? And then in the OP, you see him at the round table and you're just <laughs> yeah. like... <laughs> well, speaking of things that happen at the beginning of the, speaking of things that happen at the beginning of these episodes, these multi-minute recaps gotta fucking stop. I don't mind them. I mean, uh, every for starters, episode, I took a, not even like not even at the end of an arc or like the beginning of a new arc. Every yeah, you can episode, just fast forward through them. Yeah, but like, every time, like I get that it can be. I guess I kind of get your also, with them, but like, to me, it's like if I, I need also, a refresher. Also, also, and, the, and the, you might you might call this nitpicking, but if you're if you if you're a, a Nihongo a Nihon citizen and you're uh, watching this live on broadcast, you can't skip them. The, the, yeah, when you wa watch them live, you watch the whole thing unless you taped it. But see, I am not a Nihongo citizen. I can just skip it. And so it doesn't affect my viewing experience because I can just, I mean, the same thing happens in like Hunter Hunter, which granted that's extremely long running. So it's a bit more justified in that point. To, but to me, it's always just like, yeah, but I can skip it. So it's, it's not a big deal. You know, well, it's that, it's, it's not even just, it's not even just at the oh, beginning of like every episode too. Like, uh, in, let me try to remember the exact episode it was like the A, uh, no. Nine, ten. I don't 11, remember the episode, 12, but I know what you're talking about. Where they'll 13. have an intro yeah, in episode and 13. then transition to recap. Uh, no, well, I was in episode thirteen when we're uh doing the thing where we, uh they they defeat Rip and they uh you know fight him off. There's like this whole uh flashback recap mid episode of something that like literally happened seven minutes ago. We we flash back to the where the the narrator explains the entirety of Rip's defeat and how they everyone used their abilities against him. Uh, okay, that one. Uh, I I remember what you're talking about, and my first thought was to groan, but I actually in the end thought it was a bit justified for explaining that we the, literally the fact just that the... saw it. <laughs> okay, but it's like explaining the mechanics behind it. Where, oh, the asteroid was to launch him up, which, granted, he shouldn't have known it was an asteroid. That's still kind of fucking stupid. But at least we get the explanation of how it happened. Although, I felt that the explanation of her powers... Uh, I mean, gr I don't even I really feel that I felt like I understood but... it the first time, just watching it yeah. all happen. And that I, this I whole flashback her recap powers, thing I understood it. was completely Although, unnecessary I, okay. and a waste of time. It wasn't completely unnecessary. It was... 
a bit of i will agree somewhat that it's a waste of time and that it could have been exposited way quicker but the information that andy put all of his power into the one uh fire of his parts bullet because it wouldn't have reached her otherwise i felt like that was a bit necessary to explain what because i did you know think it think to myself oh well why did his hand just kind of disintegrate on her and it, hearing that oh it's the range that affected that that was something that i felt that i needed to hear so it i, I will concede that it's a little you know a, a, a little stupid a little overly long but i don't think it was completely pointless i, I think you're going a little far there uh it's a, i and any episode of a show that makes me have to reach for the fast forward button, uh, like so so often, like every episode, I feel like that's a mark against the show. I don't really think so. I I, I just skipped through it. And hey, like I took you know like a four day break between episodes at one point because this podcast got, uh, got delayed. And in that instance, I watched the recap because I was like, oh, you know, it's been you know a few days. Maybe I should. Just catch up with everything real quick. And so in that case, it was actually a little a little helpful. Especially because I have dog shit memory. But, you know, not everyone has amnesia. And apparently an inability to read, too. <laughs> True, with the episode title. Uh, well, not episode title. Fucking the number of episodes. I'm stupid. But anyway. <laughs> uh... I guess uh, we can just go into to closing thoughts. Um, I have the, the uh, clip of Chloe slurping yarn like spaghetti uh, playing on loop in my head forever now because I died laughing at that. That was fucking hilarious. Uh, I mean, I, I guess one last nitpick before, before we end this off. So, yeah, okay, it's episode 12. Was I the only one who burst out laughing when I saw Andy and Fuko running away from all the bullets being fired at them, with them not having to move side to side or avoid them or anything like that, and the bullets are just whizzing past and they do not have to even try to avoid them, and it's an entire squad of guys firing at them, and they, <laughs> that, that, just, that's just like they an action miss. Trope. I know that's an action trope, dude. Gunfights. Um, th th this is something I thought when I saw that scene, that gunfights in anime are consistently kind of shit because of how you have to sort of contrive this scenario where everyone constantly misses because guns are an inherently boring weapon because it's, you just fire it and they're dead. Like that, that's so you're, boring. You're, you're, you can't have much, you can't get much out of that. And so you have to make it you, unrealistic you can do gun to the play. point where they've constantly well, see, I'm not even that into, like, fight choreography. That's not a thing that I necessarily... You know, I'm more into the concepts behind the fight, so maybe guns are just boring to me, but I don't know. Like, every time I see a gunfight in anime, I'm like, this is the weakest kind of action you can do, though. Because you just fire it at them and they're dead. You know, even in a gun-focused show like Lika Rika... Well, I mean, you could make the argument of a sword being like, oh, you could swing a sword at them and they, if they don't block okay, it, they're but, dead. But, okay, but swords are fucking cool, and they, they frequently have all sorts of crazy powers in anime, where a gun is just a gun. And it's, <laughs> you just sometimes have different kinds of guns. I guess you can theoretically have a super fantastical gun, but I don't see it as often as, yeah, like, there are in of a cool fantasy anime in, where they have a super-duper special sword. Jo Jojo Part know. Five has a has a cool gun I ability seen where fucking you... Jojos though. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, they, I'll, I'll explain it real quick. Uh, it, it's kind of like this: uh, the unbelievable power that Billy was supposed to have. Where uh, uh, there's this one guy in Part Five, one of the main characters. He he carries a revolver around with him, and inside his revolver, he when he loads his bullets, uh, he also loads them with six little guys, little tiny gremlins about the size of the bullets, and when he shoots them. They uh kick the bullets in midair, like they pass them around like soccer balls, and uh they are able to change trajectory mi like mid shot. Like they they ricochet them off themselves. Like they don't even need to hit like things. They can just hit the air. But because uh, to to a layman, it would be like the bullet bounced in mid air, whereas in actuality, a little gremlin just kicked it to change its uh course. See, that sounds cool, but that's not, like, most gunplay in anime, I guess. Where, like you were saying with swords, it feels like there's more tension and weight 
where you can get more you can wring more emotion out of it when it's two people like clashing swords directly is, and they're like, is, is this why you didn't like other. the fight scenes in uh, licorice recoil well i sort of came around on them but yeah that that's, oh, that that's show had some good it. gunplay uh fights it, it had good choreography but good choreography doesn't even always register with me uh specifically when is the guns do do not show the bagel the john wick movies i'm not a true american after all i i, I don't like my second amendment right uh, enough anyway <laughs> do not play the metal gear solid games but with all that said and done and random gun tangent aside i think the show is improving uh granted i might go back on that after watching episode 16 but from what I saw of it, it was getting it was getting much better. The biggest problem was removed. Uh, the show is pretty when it's not the backgrounds. If you just forget, if you pretend that the characters <laughs> are on a black void, it is a fine looking show. I I there were a few moments like throughout this block where I was like, wow, this color palette is like really bad. Like, uh, I, the, that I think the entirety of the, 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 the red, the red that was used for the Victor fight was, like, really ugly and, like, kind of just made it hard to see. Yeah, I mean, they're doing that sort of Shinbo-esque thing where you dye everything the same color palette, but worse and not as good. Like, there was one establishing shot in episode 11 that I, th that I thought was ugly as sin. It was, like, way <laughs> it felt like I had taken a normal screenshot of anime put it into sony vegas and then cranked the contrast up to max that's what it felt like and it was so putrid i was just like why i think there was a moment turn down the uh, contrast watch. i think there was a i think this happened right after they defeated rip uh and like the the water splash from the meteor uh for some reason the color palette went to like a weird gray scale where like Everyone was like very gray and like very they were very washed out colors. And I was like, why 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 does it look like this? This is hideous. Yeah, I mean it it's very inconsistent. It feels like it needed another six months to a year in the oven before being aired. Also, but what that's was up not with how the whales these days? Sudden what was up with the whale suddenly looking really, really cool? and really well animated and then you but it's in like a completely different style from the rest of the show so i enjoyed the cuts of animation but it felt jarring where it was like it, it we almost felt like we were in an, an entirely different show then we cut he back doesn't to the even look like he like belongs in the world that he's inhabiting <laughs> that exact quote <laughs> where it's just the juxtaposition it's a cool looking uh whale i'm sure the animator who did it is extremely talented but it a felt out pinocchio of place. fan oh uh, yeah pinocchio's the guy i haven't seen it since i was like what seven <laughs> yeah i did the same honestly I, I, I still gotta play lies of p yeah so in conclusion overall solid it, it's still looking a bit crusty in the visuals department, but it, it's keep it, it's keeping up better than I feared. When I saw some of those cuts in, I think it was episode episode seven or episode eight, one of those two. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure it was seven with all the ugly expressions and off model art. Uh, I thought it was gonna go completely downhill, or rather, that's what I feared. But it, it's it's trucking along. It, at the very least, that was the dip, and we're now sort of at the plateau yeah ho hopefully we're not in the midst of another dip hopefully this next arc that we're diving into with the billy betrayal is uh not not gonna lead us astray and uh, destroy all the the goodwill that's mostly built up these past eight episodes yeah but we just have to wait and see and if you want to wait and see audience uh you should subscribe <laughs> Yeah, be sure to subscribe to the channel so you don't miss an episode of the podcast. If you made it this far already, you know you, you know you want to. And be sure to also subscribe to Crunchy's channel because the by the time this comes out, maybe the the Zarigoto V3 video will be out. Uh, when when should this come out? You said uh, the twenty fourth. 
24th. So yeah, it'll be day of if I get my shit together. Hopefully I will. I'm gonna be up all night. <laughs> all right, well, in that case, I bet we, we better leave you to it. So that'll do her for this episode of the Castaway Anime Podcast. I'm Neon Manta. And I'm Crunchy Bagels. And you'll see us next time. <laughs>